Today we're going to talk about superheat. To start with, what is, what is superheat? So not how do you measure it, uh, not how do you do the math, because those are fairly easy. Learning how to do the math, learning how to measure superheat is very different than what it is, what it represents. So let's focus on that. Does anybody know what superheat represents? Heat absorbed from home. Heat absorbed from the home. Uh, that, is, that is one way above to look at it. the boiling point. It's above the boiling point. So you could have a system that was uh, improperly set up and you could be absorbing a lot of heat and you could still have an improper superheat. So superheat itself tells us really one thing. How, how, would we, how would we define that? Look at the image on the screen. It's, well, we don't always have TXVs though. So TXV is one type of metering device option. So if we have a TXV, it does tell us about the function of the TXV. TXV. That's one of the reasons we measure it. But I want to get even more kind of to the root of what it is. What is superheat? Superheat is a measurement of how full the evaporator coil is with boiling refrigerant. When we say uh, boiling, boiling is another word for, we, we kind of use it synonymously with evaporating. They're not exactly the same. We really should call it boiling rather than evaporating, but regardless, it's a change of state from liquid to vapor, right? And when we feed an evaporator coil, what goes into that metering device? What type of refrigerant goes into the metering device? Liquid refrigerant, right? We want it, it needs to be all liquid refrigerant. That's one of our primary goals. That's why we measure subcool. When we measure subcool, like we talked about last week, subcooling, we're looking at how much liquid refrigerant are we stacking in that condenser, right? The more liquid refrigerant we stack, the more likely we're gonna deliver liquid refrigerant to the metering device, right? But the more liquid we stack, the less effective area we give in our condenser, which drives our condensing temperature up, drives our head pressure up, right? which increases our compression ratio, which means our compressor doesn't move as much refrigerant. So we've got all these, everything that we do in the uh, refrigerant cycle is a balancing act, right? That's why not having enough refrigerant is a problem, having too much refrigerant is a problem. Having a metering device that's not feeding enough refrigerant into the evaporator coil is a problem. Have a metering device that's feeding too much refrigerant into the evaporator coil is a problem. So when we think about an evaporator coil, there's two things that we really wanna know in terms of what's going on inside that evaporator coil. One is, what is the temperature of the refrigerant boiling in the evaporator coil? What temperature is it? We call that evaporation temperature or evaporating temperature. And how do we know what that is? How do we know what the EVAP temperature is on an evaporator coil? Saturation. Suction saturation, right? You take that suction pressure, you look at the little scale that you know, goes across for the refrigerant you're working on, and it's gonna tell you the temperature, right? So what's a normal, um, what's a normal uh, pressure that you would see on an R410A system on the suction side? What's that? 130s, okay, so somebody pull out a, uh, a PT chart app. You can use the, uh, the Ref Tools one, you can use the Emerson one, whichever one you want. Any of you who don't have an app like this, get one. Um, the one that I prefer is called Ref Tools. It's by Dan Foss, and it has a, uh, an app within that called Refrigerant Slider. And so you set to R410A, you put your pressure in, what did you say, 130? Make sure that it's set on gauge pressure and not atmospheric pressure, because what do we measure? We measure gauge pressure, it already takes into account, subtracts out that 14.7 atmospheric pressure. So somebody give me the answer. What is it? 44.95. So if we have a suction pressure of 130 PSI, now again, in order to know for sure, we would have to measure it at the evaporator coil, but pressure drops in the suction line in a residential system are generally nominal. I mean, they're almost nothing. That means that our evaporator temperature is right about 45 degrees, right? So at 130 PSI suction, our evaporator temperature is about 45 degrees, which in Florida, with the systems that we work on day in and day out with our humidity and large evaporator coils, that is pretty standard. Pretty standard on a 75 to 77 degree indoor temperature. If it's a system that's in dehumidify mode or a little better dehumidifying system, it's gonna be closer to 40 degrees. And so if we plug in 40 degrees, that's 118.4 PSI on R410A. That's evaporator temperature. What temperature is the evaporator coil? Make sense? It makes sense why we'd want to know that, right? We want a cold evaporator coil, but we don't want it too cold. Why don't we want it too cold? Freeze. Could freeze up, right? We also don't want it colder than it needs to be because when we talk about that compression ratio, lower pressure gas going back to the compressor, right? So imagine you're, the, you're in the suction line and you're going back to the compressor. If it is lower pressure, that also means that it is lower density. That means it's lighter. Right? If there's lower pressure, that means that suction gas is lighter because we know what's in the lines, right? What should be the only thing that's inside those lines? 
refrigerant. There shouldn't be any air, shouldn't be any moisture, shouldn't be any nitrogen, shouldn't be any other refrigerants, right? So that's a big part of us being able to control for this. Things get really crazy when we start having stuff in the system that's not the refrigerant that we think it is. Then all of a sudden, all, all bets are off, right? The pressures we think we should have, we don't have, and nothing's working the way it should. But so long as there's all refrigerant in there, if we have less pressure, that means that the molecules are more separated, right? We're pushing on them less. That means they're lighter, right? So if we have lower suction pressure, that means lighter gas going back to the compressor. You all buy that? Lighter gas going back to the compressor means with every stroke of that compressor or every oscillation of that scroll, it moves less. Because while it's moving the same volume with every stroke, each volume has less mass, so it's less dense. Therefore, you're moving less refrigerant. Lower suction pressure means you're moving less refrigerant. That's why when you have a system that's running in dehumidify mode, something like that, it's not going to run as efficiently, meaning you're not gonna get as many BTUs per watt of input, meaning you're gonna spend more money to cool your house. But the good news is when you have a nice cold evaporator coil, you know, you're not gonna die of black mold. So that's good. No, sorry, that was a little extreme. The point is, is that you wanna, in Florida, we need to have cold evaporator coils. It doesn't matter if they're less efficient. We need to have cold evaporator coils, or at least the ability to have a cold evaporator coil, because if we don't, we're not gonna dehumidify the way we need to. We need to know the evaporator temperature. In this case, we said it was 45 degrees. But then we also need to know how full is the evaporator coil of boiling temperature. Because when we say a 45 degree evaporator temperature, that's only if the refrigerant is boiling. So if we're feeding, refrigerant into the, sorry, into the bottom of the evaporator coil, and that is how evaporator coil is fed. A condenser is fed from the top, and it makes liquid down at the bottom. Makes sense, right? An evaporator coil is fed in the bottom, and it boils, and vapor comes out the top. It's pretty, pretty cool, pretty obvious. If you never pay attention to it, you won't notice it, but that's how it's done. So we feed liquid into the metering device. The metering device is our pressure dropper. It creates a pressure drop. When it comes out of that metering device, it immediately starts boiling. It switches from about 100% or should be 100% liquid to somewhere around 70% liquid, 30% vapor. We say that it isn't always that, but that's about right. But then as it moves through the evaporator coil, it begins boiling. And as long as it's still boiling, just like the boiling pot of water, it stays at that same temperature, 45 degrees, right? So it's 45 degrees here, 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 here. But then when it gets to 100% vapor, now it stops being 45 degrees. Now it picks up additional heat and that's what we call superheat. And if it's a low number, that means that it picked up very little heat by the time you measured it outside. If it's a high number, then that means it picked up a lot of heat, which what does that tell us? That it's not getting enough liquid. How full is this evaporator coil with boiling refrigerant? Now again, it's not all liquid. So when we say it, we're not filling our evaporator coil with liquid in the same way that we're dropping liquid down in our condenser. But what we are doing is we're filling it with boiling refrigerant. So what's more efficient? An evaporator coil that's only boiling this much and the rest here is picking up superheat or an evaporator coil that's boiling this much and only this much is picking up superheat? What's more efficient? The second one. The, the second one, yeah, the, the, the one where we're more full, right? More boiling refrigerant is better. So what does that mean? That means lower superheat equals more efficient evaporator coil. Stands to reason, right? Well, then the question is, well, why don't we just get our superheats as low as we possibly can? Why don't we get them to one? What's wrong with a one degree superheat? We could get liquid back to the condenser, right? Because our metering device, in this case, it's a TXV, has what's called a minimum stable superheat, which means that in order for it to balance out that, that balance of pressures, and we're not talking about how TXVs work today, but in order for it to do that, it has to have a little bit of a range there. It's gotta have a little buffer. So they set these things in residential, what we'll most commonly see at the outlet of the evaporator coil, something around 12, 13, 14. But sometimes you'll see it tighter than that. I've seen like this unit here runs more like six or seven. Is that more or less efficient than 12 or 14? It's more efficient. Lower superheat equals more efficient, but it also equals more risky. Has anybody ever seen those, uh, those engine tuners you can get where you can like get more horsepower out of your engine, but you can also blow it up? You know, that's kind of a thing that people do. And it's because you're running your engine tighter, you're running it more efficient, you're getting more out of it, but you're running it more risky, right? More, more chance of knocking, that kind of thing. Same thing is true here. The lower the superheat, the riskier we are. Emerson says, the, the company that manufactures Copeland compressors, which are the most common compressors, they want 20 degrees of superheat out at the compressor. That's what they want. Now, whatever, they can, you know, you know wish in one hand and whatever my grandpa used to say, but it doesn't, you know, what, what <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I forget how the saying goes, so forget it. And then I realize it's also a bad one, so we're not gonna say it right now. The point is, is that, 
they can wish that we get 20 degrees out of the compressor, but we don't have control over that because where are we setting the superheat? We're setting it inside. And what's setting the superheat? The metering device, right? Now, there was a day where we were shipping all these piston systems, systems with fixed orifices. And on a fixed orifice system, we set the superheat by how we set the charge. You want to talk about if you think charges are hard to set now, they were far more difficult to set when you had to set superheat. Because in order to set superheat on a fixed metering device system, you have to know the inside wet bulb temperature and you have to use a superheat calculator. So you take outside dry bulb, inside wet bulb, use a superheat calculator, you hit that number, but it's a moving target. Because as you're charging it, what's happening to the indoor temperature? It's dropping, right? So you're trying to hit a number and it's changing while you're trying to hit it. And next thing you know, you're at zero superheat and then you got to get your recovery tank out and pull some out. It's a real pain in the butt. Whereas with us, all we're doing is we're hitting a subcool number. We're watching our evaporator temperature to make sure, okay, it's good. Our CTOA is in range for what we would expect. And we're watching our superheat to make sure our valve's doing its job, which is what back to what Matthew was saying. We watch our superheat on most of the systems we work on just to make sure this metering device is doing what it's supposed to do. If our superheat drops too low, that's an indication that the valve is overfeeding. If our superheat's too high, that's an indication that the valve is underfeeding if everything else is how it's supposed to be. And that's the key thing. Valves get misdiagnosed all the time because we don't check all the other stuff we're supposed to check first. Do we have a temperature drop across our liquid line dryer? Do we have an airflow problem? Are we providing the valve with the proper subcooling, proper liquid refrigerant in order for it to do its job? So we do all those things first, but we still monitor superheat. And this is what frustrates me when I ask people, how do you check the refrigerant charge on a TXV system. And they'll say subcool. It's always subcool, right? Well, you could have a subcool that you're supposed to have, but your evaporator temperature could be off, your superheat could be off, your CTOA could be off, and you hit the subcool number and they say the charge is good. If everything else is right, everything else is functioning how it's supposed to, airflow is right, condenser airflow is correct, valve is operating properly, then yes, we set the charge by subcool. And as an installer, most cases, most cases other than airflow, those, other, those things are all gonna be in line because it's a brand new piece of equipment, right? So you know, generally speaking, you get the subcool right, then you're, you're, you're in good shape. That's also why you follow the weigh-in guidelines. You, know, you look at what needs to be weighed in first. You're not just guessing. So you're using a lot of different data points to say, this is good, this is in line, this is in line, this is in line, I weighed the charge in, subcool is good, now this is all good. If I go here, 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 this is saying that I don't need to weigh charge in, but now my subcool is way off question mark, right? What's going on here? Why, why is this happening? Is it that my line temperature clamp isn't measuring properly? Is it that maybe my gauge isn't pushing the Schrader in the way it's supposed to, so I'm not reading the right pressure? Those are the sorts of things that happen all the time. You always have to second guess when you see one of those data points, everything else looks beautiful, and one data point's way off. Most often, it's something wrong with the measurement itself. But sometimes it could be something wrong with the equipment. Usually when it's something with the equipment, you're gonna have more than one data point. This is high, this is low. You know, you're gonna have a couple things that are showing off. In terms of what you should get on a TXV system, 10 degrees Fahrenheit plus or minus five degrees. But again, that's measured inside. If you got a short line set, your suction temperature inside and your suction temperature outside will be pretty close to each other. There's not gonna be a big change. We've insulated it all the way out. It's running underneath the house where it's not hot. But if you have a 50, 60, 70, 80 foot line set running through an attic, it's gonna be significantly higher temperature out of the condenser than it is at the evaporator coil. And that's easy to calculate. Just calculate your superheat outside. All right, I got 25 degrees superheat. Is that good or bad? Well, what's your suction temperature outside? Look at that. Now look at the difference between your suction temperature outside and your suction temperature inside. That difference is gonna be a decrease in superheat at the evaporator coil. So if I'm measuring 25 degrees outside and inside the suction temperature is 10 degrees colder than what it is outside, then that means that I've got 15 degrees superheat. That means I'm in line, right? Now, is that good? No. 25 degrees superheat is not good for the compressor. It means the compressor is going to run hot its whole life. But sometimes we don't have control over that. We don't have control in Vista K, for example, about the fact that they run these insanely long line sets and now have really high superheats outside. But they are going to have abnormally high compressor failure on average over life, over their lives because of that. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to fail in five years. They might fail in 12 years when they would have normally lasted 15, right? So we don't, you know, a lot of this stuff we say, well, that's bad. It's going to cause a problem. Well, it may not cause 
cause a problem for a really long time. It's just like pulling a good vacuum. A lot of old timers will say, well, I never used a micron gauge. I never, you know, pulled a deep vacuum. Well, you know, I never had a problem. Well, that doesn't mean anything because it's not like you'd pull a bad vacuum and the system explodes 10 minutes after you leave. Like that's not how that works. What it means is, is that you've taken years off of its life. It's just like when you, you know, if you smoke your first cigarette, oh, this didn't do anything to me. Well, you know, you get black lung 25 years down the road. It's not something that happens to you immediately. Black lung is probably not what that is. That's something different. So the point is we're looking for 10 to 15 degrees superheat or five to 15 degrees superheat at the evaporator coil outlet. And five is pretty low. Like five would be like, ooh, that's, that's low. Six, seven would be kind of more what we're looking for. Um, this rule of thumb applies to a lot of different types of equipment, you know, refrigeration units, a lot of different types of things. So for us, it's more going to be like six to 14 on the inside. And then you're going to accept up to 20 uh, is going to be acceptable on the outside unless there's some other reason that we have no control over, like a really long line set, something like that. Does that make sense? So what is superheat? How much boiling refrigerant? How much boiling refrigerant, right? How far are we putting boiling refrigerant into this evaporator coil? We compare that to evaporator temperature and that tells us the whole story. Make sense? How do we measure it quickly? We didn't even talk about that, but I assume you all know. How do we measure superheat? Saturation Yep, it's the difference between suction saturation, otherwise known as evaporator temperature, what you're reading on the gauge, compared to the actual physical line temperature. That's all it is. And it's always, the physical line temperature is always gonna be higher. You can't have negative superheat, you can't have negative subcool. If you do, that means that there's a measurement problem. Something's wrong with the measurement that you're taking. Make sense? Awesome, have a wonderful week. Thank you all so much. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing, you can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.